Welcome to the Investor Financing Podcast, where we interview real estate investors and lenders so you can learn all the secrets to getting your projects funded and scale your portfolio. Learn about fix and flip loans, Burr financing, rental, fix to rent, commercial, multifamily bridge loans, business loans, and so much more. And now, your host, Bo Eckstein. Hello, everyone. I don't know where Ty is today, but I think he uh, is respecting the blackout uh, Tuesday. I am too. So we're just streaming into our Facebook group today because, um, you know, I'm still working today. Um, and, and, I, and I had this plan. So wanted to go forward. And I know a lot of the people in our investor group are always uh, are at home right now and, and people want something positive. So I figured we'd pick the brain of uh, Tommy today. Um, and just kind of dive into real estate because I think real estate's a good thing to take your mind off of everything. <laughs> it consumes your life when you're in this business. Yeah. Um, but for you, uh, some of you listening probably have been to our bar camps and maybe heard Tommy present in the past. But you know, Tommy's got a, a lot of experience. Uh, he was um, a buyer for a large uh, fund, um, and you know, he's bought in, you know two, three thousand homes and and rented them out, you know, you know, he had to turnkey them. And then now he has his own company and he does it on a, a little bit smaller scale, but he does quite a, quite a bit of volume considering he has, you know, a, a small, small team, several guys and girls on the team, but you got about a staff of five or so. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, he, he goes in and his model is he does some flipping, but he, he likes to, he likes to buy and hold and burr. Um, but he does it with portfolios. And I think that's a great model because a lot of the conversations I'm having now and Tommy, we've had these conversations is, is with financing being a little tougher, um, you know, to implement the, you know, buy, 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 and then try to refinance with a bank or a portfolio loan. for people that don't have the experience. It's, it's awfully difficult right now. And, and, and hopefully, you know, if, if you've been around for a while, you have good connections with banks, which will enable you, but, in the past, we were able to do 80% of purchase on, on portfolios where somebody would buy a portfolio. Now, on refinances, you're looking at a max of 70% loan to value. Um, they typically want the assets to be worth at least 125000 to 150000 minimum price, right? So if you're buying in Indiana, you're getting kind of stuck. And I'm seeing a lot of borrowers, um, investor friends that are in this kind of position right now. But I do think there'll be some 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 banks and some funding sources that come back into the space because to me it's it's one of the safest places to be a cash flowing stabilized asset so it only makes sense that once the liquidity opens up that this is one of the products that needs to come back first but um but anyways tommy why don't you give like a little bit of a background doesn't have to be that in depth because a lot of people may know you already and then we can kind of dive in with questions and and so forth yeah so simple our 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 model now you know working from nearest to, to oldest is we're a buy fix and sell company and um historically you know you could live off of the the proceeds of your buy fix and sell business but i use mine to pretty much cover the overhead in order for me to buy more rentals and uh, i kind of have a rental addiction so recently into the covid stuff i've really only been buying out of state rentals i haven't bought any california flips but we have about 30 california flips going right now um, I got a heavy trustee sale background, um, door knocking, any questions you guys have for the general foreclosure process activity, anything you got an open book. That is awesome. Um, so, so I didn't realize you had 30, 30 flips in just California. Are you doing out of state right now too? Yeah, we probably got another five, six, seven ish in Indiana, Missouri, and Florida. Um, two in Texas actually too. So maybe more, maybe we're only like 40 ish. But it fluctuates um, at any given time. So, so um, is your model then now with the the, the kind of market that's? Um, are you going back to like heavy kind of getting ready to buy off the steps again? Is that kind of like what you're thinking? No, I. You know, uh, for those of you that follow uh, data wise in California, the Norris Group has kind of form you know formulated it that it was like without the foreclosures and the note sales and the fight and any of the distress that is dragging the market down, we're still at this historically below average volume level or 
MLS activity. So uh, without the changes there, we're not going to really see, I mean, I don't foresee uh, any change of volume in the foreclosure market in the near quarter, maybe two quarters. Okay. So, so you're buying basically off market or you buy it majority or you know, relationship stuff, MLS, private party advertising stuff. That's a, I'm recently I've had a lot more people just calling me saying, Hey, are you still buying people? I haven't done deals with in a long time. Uh, I'm splitting two, one in Texas, one in Florida with a guy and um, just needed an equitable partner. So we're really just fluid with whatever comes through. It's we know still meets margin and our primary target areas, like high density areas, non-rural that stuff's selling really, really well. And our Sacramento MLS is delivering like, 44% of new listings are pending in multiples. So really all, very tough data to understand considering the narrative. I know I'm, 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 I'm actually really lost because the market's hot Yeah, and, and I would not expect it to be hot. I think everybody's kind of like what's going on, but you know, I, I think it's going to be hot for a certain amount of time and then, everything that's happening right now is going to be delayed, right? Like the economic stuff. Don't you think, it, you know, after the stimulus and everything that three or four months from now, it's going to show um, more of a, uh, more of a sign that we're going into a decline. Would you say, I mean, cause we don't see it right now. So I'm just trying to figure out. Yeah. I, you, to what you say, I would say yes, that if it's going to happen, it's for some reason it hasn't been happening as fast as everybody would have anticipated it was. So I would say we're at least that 90 days ish out or so. And real estate's not liquid. I mean, it's easy ish, but you know, if, if, if it does turn on you, once the emotion turns, it, it goes, this market goes quiet. So, so these 30 houses you're fixing right now in California, are those going to be all up for sale or how many are going to go into your rental portfolio? Um, you know, I would say it's changed historically. The numbers are more like one in 10. I'd try and keep, yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter whether I, I was a price point exit. I mean, if I can afford to keep it, I would, no matter what the equity was, I can make a hundred grand on it today or whatever. I, if I bought it for 60, I bought it for 160 and it was worth, you know, 300 with X amount of work in it. Um, I keep those and go into long-term capital gains and try and keep them and then exchange out of them in the long term. I would say almost all of them are sales right now. Just, uh, you know, one of them I was going to keep forever, but the fire insurance is irrational, you know, so piece by piece by piece, I'd say only the stuff I've bought out of state, I'm going to keep all my California flips are going to, I'm going to sell them. Is that also too? Cause rental laws and things and like it just, the price to rent ratios are different. No, uh, it's, it, for me, I still keep it. I, it's not a science. I still keep it a gross yield, you know, because I don't have, we manage all of our assets in house versus, you know, I have duplexes or triplexes down in Merced. I don't manage those. So the, you know, the, the percentages for what it costs to manage these things is different. I mean, out of state, I have private, I have, I have property managers that manage everything and um, I still get such high yields that I just keep that stuff safe, easy, no debt. And all your deals. So you, you're, you, your business model has never been like direct to borrowers. You're really just working with agents and wholesalers typically. No, I, I heavy. I mean, I got my five brands that are advertising brands is directly from buyers. I mean, you know, direct sales stuff, 916 buy sells my primary regional advertising brand. And I love houses.com is my national advertising brand. And to make it easy for your listeners, I mean, we, we started doing stuff out in uh, some of the counties north of Austin, Texas. You post a Facebook ad there, people call like crazy. Like it's like 8x the amount of volume you get and the clicks are cheaper. Yeah. yeah. So, so you're doing, you, you, do you have a, a pay-per-click person or you run the ads yourself on those? I've been using a marketing company out of Missouri that buys it all and, and places it all and tweaking it as we go. It's a science. I'll tell you, I still don't. I wish I could better understand it and commit some time to it. I mean, I would trade real estate knowledge with whoever out there understands the pay to click stuff better. I will trade you whatever you need real estate knowledge wise so I can better understand how to maximize my advertising dollars. 
Well, yeah, I'm in the same boat you are because I, I, I actually earlier today I posted because I'm, I'm trying to uh, bring in people that want to borrow money on multifamily. Um, yeah. And so I started doing a lot of bigger multifamily loans and their bigger commissions. And, you know, that's the goal of everything we do in real estate is, you know, bigger. I'd rather spend more money on deals that are going to make, pay me a higher return. And and so it made sense. But I've been hitting singles for years now and I'd rather be hitting singles right now. Safer. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, but, but in like a transaction base, like selling real estate or doing loans, like it's, the same amount of work doing a million dollar loan than it is a hundred thousand dollar loan. Yeah. And I, and I make 10 times the amount of money. Yeah. Mine's a, it's work versus risk in our world. You know, right. I, I moved the zero. I'm not doing Bay area million dollar flips. We put one on the market for eight and a quarter this week here in Sacramento Valley. And I, and I, I sweat it at just a cost of carrying that thing every day. You know, it's just a different beast. And you know what's interesting about you? And like, I'll look at some of the areas you flip houses at, like where nobody else will go. Like, everybody mm-hmm. wants to go, like San Francisco Bay Area. You'll do the little, little like, um, kind of like bedroom communities that you know the population's not that great. Like, the, you go into places where most people wouldn't take the risk, but you—that's kind of your niche. Is that you? You kind of like know those markets, and like you're yeah. like, okay, I can I can take this risk on this property, and. And, and so I've seen you do a couple in some like small wine country places. And, and, um, and so I get, I, that's a whole different way to look at things that, you know, if you buy right, no matter where there's going to be a buyer for it, but, but you also run into like, if it's an unusual property, can you give me an example of something you bought that was unusual? That was just the, the biggest pain in the ass to sell that you would probably. I'll give you my, the current world we live in. I bought one. Uh, about two, two different counties, one Butte, one in, in Yuba, and e- easy there. The closest one is probably 75 miles from here, which is, I live in Placer County. And the other one's probably 90, 95 miles from here. And they're two just tiny communities way up in the middle of nowhere. Well, I bought one for 19 grand and one for like 76. So the spreads are huge on you know what the products are worth. But you to drive up there, you know, you're committing a half a day to manage these things. I did an unlawful detainer, got possess, you know, got my writ, served our writ, had a scheduled lockout, and COVID nineteen hit, and now I have a new court date. I couldn't even lock out a lockout that was confirmed because of the squashing of the evictions. So political unrest, all these things that play into why people make the decision. It's not worth my time to go all the way up there. Well, at my purchase price, it was, but I have this cash for keys situation now where I, I'm, I'm paying handsomely to people to relocate, uh, building it into the purchase price. Cause I can't evict. You can't get people out. Mm. The world's That's- changing. Yeah, I know. I, I mean, on the rentals I own in Indiana, I think about, I have like three, I had one move out. Um, they were running a, they had a master lease and they were running an Airbnb business out of one of my houses in South Bend and they, they moved out. Um, and then I have, I think out of the rest of them, maybe two that are behind. One worked at a casino and the casino shut. So she hasn't been able to pay me in two and a half months. Um and at some point, yeah, when, when, when it lifts, I, you know, I, I always try to be fair, but, but what I've understand about, um, you know, you can't show favoritism to anybody. No, you, know, you, you have to have the same yeah, eviction, pro- yeah. same, eviction s- same eviction process. Um, so what, what is your number one go to for finding deals right now? Like, uh, as far as paid marketing that you're doing, that you're getting the most kind of bang for your buck. You know, paid marketing, um, I'd say we get the best activity out of Facebook right now, um, but the iBuyers are way different. The mailers are, if people choose your mailer out of the many that show up, you get a better seller. You know, you get someone who's not just clicking on every single ad, every single website. That's on the paid side. Uh, for the people who are just doing one deal at a time or maybe out of state deals, I, just the standard REO websites, you know, Zoom and Hubzoo, there's still a lot of worthwhile transactions coming out of that stuff, the products. And 
uh, my current, at least a third of my volume right now is coming from people that just have a deal or agents that want to represent me on the sale. I'm not an agent or a broker. So they just say, this just came in our office meeting. Would you want it? And we can make an offer. At least a third of my volume is coming from that. That's good. And that's mostly localized though. So how, like in these other markets, you're in, uh, you buy a little in Missouri, Indiana, and Texas right now. Yep. And then um, how did you start buying in those areas and, and why those areas? Just relationships. It's a, uh, one was um, my California broker moved to, uh, he has a brokerage in Florida and he has California. And he says, hey, when this comes through, do you want to make an offer on it? So we bought one or got in contract on one in Winter Haven, Florida today, which is a submarket of um, Orlando. And uh, he went to college there and he's willing to do the fix up. So that worked out really well. And then it was um, a friend that was on, un, you know, unemployed said, Hey, I'm available. You know, in the meantime, if you want to buy something flips it, I'll fix it up. So I paid them for construction management services in Indiana and Missouri, same way. Um, and then I split a deal in cause it was so worth both of our whiles. I put up the money for a deal in Texas and the guy and I split it on a hurdle deal. And that one, I don't have to lift a finger on. And the margins are significantly higher. And then, um, okay. And, and out of those states, like right now, like where where would you see yourself spending more time? Um, you know, like what state right now would you like is your top favorite, I guess? I love the distress of, of Florida. I don't know, people, it's an international market. I just love the stuff we're getting in Florida. I wish I could do more there, but I, you know, they're three hours ahead of time and it's a different beast. I don't have a, a, a team set up to do maybe more than one, a quarter, two at a time. And that's mostly in that winter Haven that you're like, no, and that's actually the Tampa oh. St. Pete market and the, and the Orlando market. I can't, I don't have anybody outside of those markets that I've ever turned anything with. I have one in Tallahassee right now that I'm keeping as a rental in my IRA. Um, and I've never been, to, I don't know anything about the Tallahassee market, but I hired a handyman that does the bidding for me and he gets paid to bid everything. So it's working out right now. I know you've done this for a long time, so it's a little bit easier for you than most people that are watching and listening or will be listening to. But like, how do you, how do you gauge these people that you're going to like potentially, you know, you haven't done a deal with them. And I mean, some of them you have relationships with, but what about a person you don't have any relationship with? I mean, how do you go about determining, like, in your mind, I mean, do you have some kind of system that you kind of, like, vet them out with? I mean, like, when you ask for a budget, obviously, if it's a piece of shit, you know, that's a red flag. I mean, how, how do you go about, I mean, sure. it's yeah, a red flag. Um, we had what's called a slicer when I was at Imitation Homes. And it basically said, if you buy in 1976, three-bedroom, two-bath, anywhere from 1,300 to 1,450 square feet, your budget's 27 grand. That basically just meant... After doing 500 of these, you know, I mean, essentially what your budget was going to be. When you bring it down to the small scale that we're doing right now, and you're gauging who you're going to be working with and deciding on, you know, uh, if you know how much a square of roofing costs here, if you know it's seven bucks a square foot to pour concrete here, the numbers don't always transfer. So we did, I'm doing one in Tulsa, Oklahoma right now. We chose someone off of Craigslist. Um, he drove, he said, I'm in the area right now. He shoots a photo of the house says, I'm looking at about 1500 bucks. And we said, here's what we'll do. You know, we'll commit to the first day's work minimum and you put a deposit down. It's just risk and reward. I mean, if someone burns you for 150 bucks of your deposit, he didn't actually even require a deposit, but it's just risk and reward. You know, can we get a $300 day done? Him and one guy were 300 bucks for their, whatever it was, six, eight hours and dumping. And they got almost everything done. So on a two day job, we ended up spending about 700 bucks with the dump fees. And so in taking a bid, it was 1500 bucks for everything or breaking it down onto a, a one day's actual, you know, labor for a guy, you know, he broke it down for his numbers. It was like, you know, 25 bucks an hour for the two dudes and however many hours they committed to, we accomplished it. We got the job done and we were able to meet budget. So it's just communication and, you know, setting your expectations ton of before and after photos and we w9 everybody i mean everybody that, that works under the table you know we, we make sure that we w9 everybody so we can keep track of it for, for taxes yeah no, that's that's good I, I like breaking it down per day because that's been my problem out of state investing is 
is, you know, we get a bid and then things go awry and, and, you know, but if you break it down into little chunks, I think it's just. People will advertise. They'll say, I'm at 25 bucks an hour for any and all odd jobs. They'll say that. I say, okay, good. I'll do a two hour minimum. I want you to go over there, shoot the photos, meet the, meet the, you know, locksmiths are always licensed usually. So you meet a licensed locksmith. He meets you there. He shoots the photos, the acquisition photos, and we stabilize an asset for just a few hundred bucks. And then you put a bid together. Have you used any of those third party like boots on the ground companies where they'll actually go out and take photos for you and stuff or, or, you know what? I haven't, um, some of them were acquired, I think by porch, or I think Lowe's owns and they're trying to get a product out there. So you use their app for, um, purchasing any and all, you know, if you, if you have a job site, you can purchase it all through their app and pick it up at the local Lowe's and have your guy install it there. It's a great system, but I haven't used them. That's pretty interesting. That's pretty interesting. Um, so, so like, how do you go about, um, you know, like I think now is a little bit different than in the past, but how did you go when, when you were, you know, kind of starting your business? Um, how did you go about putting, did you borrow private money typically and hard money? And then, um, and then refinance with bank loans. I mean, what does it look like with, you know, I mean, you have 35 or so 40 deals right now. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So that, it really is it, to make it relevant, especially to your business is that I look at every loan and every relationship as an annualized relationship and the, the every turn, every foreclosure, every flip you know, vacants are 90 days. That's the standard. What am I operating at right now? 155 days. You know, so it's like if you can do four 90 day turns in a year and your cost of money is 10%, you're just killing it. You know, you're, you're making great, great money. You know, so if you get money at what it used to be was like, you know, get 90 cents loan, 90% loan at 799, two points. Well, if you turn the money four times in a year at two points, you paid eight points on your rate, you're at 16 before transactional costs. So you look at your annualized cost of money, you know, say at, at title and escrow is 1% every time, it costs you 20% a year to borrow the money. So you, I would always work for relationships that allowed me to buy it, you know, maybe pay points annually or, or not pay points at all. Our standard we're using is 10% flat, 10% flat. Some people get seven and one, some people get seven and three, as long as I get commitment for the money for 12 months, however they want to do it, uh, so, we borrow. So, so some, some of, once you build this relationship, some of them just might lend the money to your LLC and you just pay them annually. Like you get 10%. So when that money comes back, you don't necessarily have to pay them off. As long as when the year is up, you pay them back. Yeah. Unless like, so for instance, and in Florida, they have what's called doc stamps. It's basically just like recording taxes. And so you can tell them, hey, it's, I can record you on the asset, but it, it, there are unnecessary closing costs that you know, are going along with that. So if you want to remain unsecured on the file, here's what it looks like. You know, it's almost a benefit for both parties. We incentivize to not have to pay uh, you know, these taxes. But in California, when you record, the taxes are reasonable for the deed of trust and you get a security position. So it's a whole lot easier just to borrow from someone private money and you know, record against it. The foreclosure process presents, um, really, it's all, it's all public. You know, the, the NTS, the, the notice of default was recorded. The trustee sale was recorded. You see your deed recorded, and then you record their deed of trust. You're listening to the Investor Financing Podcast. We'll be right back after this break. Are you looking for funding? Are you getting frustrated trying to find a lender? Visit InvestorFinancingPodcast.com and click the Get Funding button. Complete the simple form and schedule a free phone consultation with one of our placement specialists. We have a proprietary directory of funding partners that can help you get the funding you need. It's fast and easy to explore the options available for your specific needs. Don't wait. Visit InvestorFinancingPodcast.com and get connected. Connected. You know, like it's just, it's all concurrent. You, you can see it, you can audit it. It's super easy on the lending side. It, and that's why institutionally, the products you were seeing were, you know, the margins were getting a lot better, a lot more favorable for the investors. Now they've gone up so much. 
But to make it applicable to your listeners, if you're only doing one deal at a time, you're doing a like a cash on cash, re, you know, return. I mean, ultimately, it's a big, if it costs you two points to borrow and 10% interest in your annualized cost of money is 12, what's the cost of not doing the deal? You know, so it's just relative to right now. You can't get hung up on your cost of money. But as an operator, I see myself differently than a flipper. Someone who comes in and does one, two, three, four deals a year with someone's going to not going to get the terms that I'm expecting. But if I can get a financial partner, someone that invests in me, invests in my flips, invests in stuff I currently own that's you know undercapitalized, I can get longer term loans put out there and they get exactly what they want. They get a return, they get the right investor, and it just and they just keep the money with you as long as you know everything they're getting the payments on time and they're getting payoffs from escrow. Very, you know, very rare and very rarely do we turn over investors. Okay. Yeah. So, so now you, most times then like your initial agreement with, with your investors typically, do they want, you know, do you shoot for the, like, Hey, let's keep your money in play for at least two years. Uh, yeah, we're, we're writing 180 day prior to this, we were writing 180 day notes, you know, or 365 day notes because we didn't know exactly when the deal would mature. Um, and we haven't had to borrow anything in the last seven or eight weeks. So uh, I think I will write, you know, annualized terms, but 90% of what we're doing is secured assets, you know, first single family, first deeds of trust. Anyway, some people will, when before, when there was auctions and foreclosures, people would go into a cashier's check format for us to go and buy something to secure them to. That's a completely different process. So, and, and, and for your flipping business, like these properties in California, do you prefer, uh, uh, a land, I mean, a, a, a trust, or do you prefer hold, um, acquiring these properties in an LLC or a S corp? I mean, what do you, what's favorable for active flipping? Um, yeah, you, well, I know you're, I know you're not a CPA or a tax. No, company. great question. I, I, you have to retire your entities every so often. I, I mean, I have my main rental ent entity and it still holds everything I bought when the world fell apart. And so you're buying assets for a tenth of their replacement cost, you know, 20%, 30% of the replacement cost. I keep those in my S corp and the LLCs are far more lendable than the S corps. And if I partnered up with someone on something unique, I'll put it into a trust or uh, I still own rentals and in, in my, tr in random trusts and probates and individual files that just required vestings that didn't really match the risk level I wanted to put on my S corp. But you can easily do a trust and just duplicate it over and over and over again per flip. But the title companies now require you to have an EIN or a close and a bank account open to cash a check. Yeah, yeah. I have a personal property trust I set up. I just wanted one for the longest time. And I, it's like a four, five page trust. And, and um, it's, it's pretty cool. I mean, it's like, cool. I, yeah, I, I can, can yeah. I'd done my, my, my qualified funds into them before and use the trust, my trustee out of Missouri. She just signs everything, maintains everything, all the books, all the invoicing. And uh, you can just throw it into a trust and then have the, you know, your TPA be the beneficiary. What are you, um, are you doing any, do you ever do any um, acquisition with seller finance or creative financing or it's just kind of you've yeah. been a, a cash buyer? No, they're the best. You can make your money go so much longer. I did, a, you know, we're selling one. We just got possession of one yesterday that I did two, three years ago. And, and in, I don't buy a lot of houses in nicer neighborhoods. I do a lot of what, whatever distress comes through, I'll just take it. And this is one where it had a loan on it and uh, the heirs, it doesn't affect their credit at all. You know, all I did was cure it, shine it up and rent it. You know, I paid for the probate, paid the heirs out. And um, I kept the loan intact. It's just a subject to deal. Yeah. Yeah. We had a guy on the show and he's, that's all he's doing now is subject to, he's pretty, he like studied the shit. Yeah. He's a pretty interesting guy. I have three or four deals right now where tenants have been there for there. They were the old owners. They just, they call the advertising. Like, hey, look, I want to sell it, but I don't want to move. You, it's simple. You just put terms together that make sense. Yeah. Keep and, in there. You get and, it I, and on subject to deals, do you like to buy those in a trust or an LLC or, I mean, you know, it, um, I, it depends on, for my situation, it depends on where the money's coming from. If it's my own personal capital or it's money I keep in my S-Corp, I'll just buy it directly in the S-Corp. But um, if they're weird ones, you know, like um, 
we ended up taking our trailer park into an S corp and those things are highly litigative, you know? So, uh, we, it turns out we walked into a lawsuit on the previous guy had been suing the insurance company before it went to foreclosure sale. And so stuff like that, individual weird assets will take into a trust and just do them off, you know, one off. So they're not tied directly to the corporation tied. So, so what what's your uh, focus going forward now? I mean, I know obviously you got to get through these these flips, and the, you're gonna just are you, is your model st still the same as it was pre COVID, um, or have you kind of? Yeah, I I would say that I'm in flux. I I'm a, I'm totally open to doing deals. I just have taken our we've taken our time to per, you know perfect our processes and clean up old files and. I mean, I would say if you and I had done this four weeks ago, I probably had another 10 flips I've exited out of, you know, or, you know, just stuff that matured that I'm not looking to load up on the same product. We were much like lending. We had lowered our standards. You know, you have these weird standards that are all subject to uh, what's happened at time and place in the market. We bought some weird rurals and things that we don't want to get stuck with. So if I can get it in Sacramento proper, or these major MSAs, any Bay Area product is burning hot. You know, I'm like, I'm still going to do those deals. But occupancy really matters now. And what's, um, your, like, what's like your vision of, of your real estate business? I mean, where do you see this going? I mean, like, do you want to keep doing this because you love it? I mean, or do you have a plan? Like, in five years, where do you see yourself? What do you see yourself doing? The same thing because you're a deal junkie? Or no. No, I, I loved, I, I'd rather do 10, 12 artsy fartsy flips than do 40 or 50 anymore. You know, I actually really enjoy being part of the transformation and the start to finish of a flip. And when you become a volume flip, you know, company, you lose control of some of those items. I, I've probably only been on site at maybe half of our flips. I do it all off of photo and general guidance. So I'd love to get back to doing just enough flips to, to cover the overhead and, and get become a company that's more buy and hold based. Just not doing enough of it right now. That's good. I mean, um, I mean, I, I, yeah, I don't know how you do what you do because it's just like, seems like, I mean, obviously it, there's probably good money or there could be money, good money. Right. Um, so you're doing it for you, you, you know, it's your background, but it just seems like, God, just the management itself. I don't know how, you know, you, it's just like, uh, what are you looking at some kind of, do you use like Podio or how do you kind of like just keep track of all the payments, all like everything, your life? I mean, how do you do it? Our, my bookkeeper has a bookkeeper, okay. you know, like, I think that's, that's the better part of this is, is that if you always hear people say like, Oh, if you systemize, it's going to be so much easier. And, I, you know, I don't live in that world. I see friends of mine that can flip a house in 15 days. And I, you know, we used to be there where you're doing one deal at a time, or if you have one in rehab, one that's pending sale and one that just closed, you know, you can overlap them. But ours, I would say that I'm more of a real estate opportunist. You know, I don't, my, my software was based off of high volume Vegas foreclosures. I would get off a plane in Vegas in the bottom of the market. There was a thousand sales a day. Sometimes a lot of postpones, a lot with short sale, a lot would, you know, never go to sale, but you could see a hundred houses go to an auction, you know, 30, 40, 50 houses go to auction in a single day. You could buy product really easy and you didn't have to have these systems in place. So the management on our side is, the two biggest factors are you can got to be basically the equivalent of your own contractor. You know, you're subbing stuff out um, or you got to have your own money in order to compete. Cause if you don't have those two under control, you got to buy at levels that sellers aren't willing to release product at. That's good. <laughs> what, um, what was I going to ask? I had a question and I just dropped the ball on it. Um, so, um, well, I forgot what I was going to ask Tommy. It, I had a good question too. I hate when I do that. A brain freeze. I had a brain um, freeze. Brain freeze. You guys it's a. Uh, I feel like people always say, "Hey, I've always wanted to get into foreclosures." It's such a broad, broad word, and you know there is. 
I think with our, you know, the aging generation above us, people are selling stuff as is in these neighborhoods that are so worth living in. I mean, I've seen a lot of very low margin, great, you know, equity plays for people that I wouldn't necessarily take some of those on because we have full construction costs and, you know, your $30,000 flip is sometimes our 40, you know, just because you're only doing one, you handle it better, you manage it better, you manage it faster. Um, so, but to make it applicable to your, your audience, so it's doable and it's easy. Like some of the people on the call may be doing their first flip and others are just trying to get to maybe doing two at a time. Uh, it just comes down to, have you tracked your data? Can you portray, can you look at the, from the high, the high level and say, good news lender, this is what I got. This is what I'm doing. And there's no gaps. There's no what ifs. It's the strict data shows here's how the money gets placed and here's when the money comes back and here's how the money's protected and it comes down to security in terms. So it's easy. And I think right now too, because we went from an environment of lenders lending 90% and hundred percent of re repair costs to like 70% and hundred percent of repair costs or 75%. Right. So a lot of people are, are, are not able to, you know, there's, a lot of people got eliminated from flipping, right? Because they needed the leverage yeah. to buy. So, so it's more important than ever to build these relationships with, with private lenders. I mean, it's just it really is. Yeah. I mean, you need your combination of everything. Um, but I think now more than ever is, is the time to like really build those relationships with well, people, people who are gainfully employed can still do bird deals. Even if they're using borrowing money from organizations like your own, you know, you get into something that, it needs to be, you got to tell a story to the lender, bought it. It was a turd sandwich, rehabbed it. It's shiny and rented. I'd like to get whatever percentage of my money back. I'd like to refinance it. But the Burr model got really hurt for people who really were waiting on, you know, maybe a closing right as the world was shutting down or maybe a product that didn't, that isn't back into the market yet. But if you're an engineer and you're gainfully employed and it's one of your fanny 10, you're not waiting on weird products like I am because I'm trying to do 10 or 12 rehabs at a time. I mean, refinances at a time. The one-off stuff is super easy. The banks would far rather lend to some person doing one deal that's gainfully employed than loan to a guy like me who's an active professional. Yeah. I mean, I always tell people too, I said, listen, like, cause every, every's first thing is they want to quit their job. Right. And I get it. Nobody wants to have a job, but leverage the job in the beginning. until you build your portfolio um, yeah. and, and keep your W2, keep your six figure salary. And then, um, you know, and then bank, because it's as simple as like, if you really play the system, you can get up to 10 properties in your personal name. Right. And then, and then you can go and go to a portfolio lender, get them all refinanced. And then now you have no properties in your name. Um, you know, they're going to show on your tax returns, but um, well, it'd be, it be depends on how you hold it. Right. Yeah. You don't, so you got to figure out how to hold it. And then you go out and just, you can go and get 10 more loans. Right. And then, and then do it, wrap them into another portfolio. I mean, that's kind of like an easy way to, I mean, I think there's a progression to it. Real estate investing, you know, start with maybe a house hack. If you're a young professional and you're W2 and maybe you buy a, a fourplex and live in one of the properties, right. Or one of the units and rent the other ones out, move out. I mean, if you can leverage bank financing in the beginning, it's, it's, it's amazing. I think I've always had a lot of write-offs and been self-employed. So it's always been difficult to get bank financing. Um, so I've always had to like think outside the box. Right. Yeah, and the, it's expectations. I mean, if you really need the money back as part of your income play, you have to sell, you have to refi or other, but people who park 10, 12, 20, 30,000 bucks, 50,000 bucks in a single rental, it's a plant, you know, planting a seed for two, three, five, ten 10 years down the road. It's either an income play. You're just going to, you know, add that to your income and 300 bucks a door you're adding or a hundred bucks a door for you know, your cash flow. And then you can exit out of it when the timing is right. You know, sell a duplex for a fourplex, sell a fourplex for a, an eightplex. You know, there's, there's plenty of opportunities to just keep the money rolling, keep the money moving, but you got to plant those seeds. And when you're gainfully employed, it's that much easier, that much easier to just buy something, stabilize it, and leave some money in it. And that's why I like the Midwest, though, because it's like you can, the cost is so cheap. Yeah. 
Like literally you can buy houses for $10,000 and be all in at 15, 16 grand and they're worth 30, 35 grand and they run out for seven, 600, 700 bucks a month. I mean, how many, that's really like an easy way. If you can figure out a formula to do that, like anybody can do that. You can put it on a credit card, right? Like I, I love cheap houses. I, I mean, I don't know. I'm instead of, I love houses, I'm going to be, I love cheap houses.com. Just buy it. I mean, I, I've got a buddy doing San Antonio subject twos right now. He's buying stuff where there's like 200 owing and it's probably worth 160, but he's getting, you know, uh, houses in these, in the neighborhoods that were worth 300 before the flood or 350 before the flood. And he's just going to manage the debt. The debt will cash flow, And he's, you know, he's, he's doing the rehabs and stabilizing them and eight years, 10 years down the road when oil's worth something again, he's going to exit out of all of them you know, into those neighborhoods. So, so can we, can we, can I pause right there? Are, is he just basically g g giving cash for keys essentially like, Hey, you want to get yeah. out of this deal? I'm going to give you three grand a move. I'll buy this subject too. And then he looks at it and goes, okay. Um, my PITI is, is 700 and oh, the rent, rent rents are 1450 or something like that. Yeah. It's, it's a non, he's not formally assuming the loans, but he is acknowledging in a contract as long as he's collecting rents, he's responsible for the payment. And he puts it in the contract as long as I'm re um, re um, receiving rents. So as long as I'm collectively receiving these rents, because that gives you the opportunity when the world, when oil became free, if everybody moved out of these oil, you know, some of these areas, it's like, and you no longer had tenants, you know, you're like, you did them a favor when it was worth 50,000 bucks less than, I mean, even if they sold it for 200 and they owed 200, they would have had to bring in 10, you know, 10,000 bucks. I mean, that's, yeah. I mean, that's like a, a way to build cash flow with no money. I mean, like people, everybody says it takes money to make money, which is to a certain degree, it, it helps. I mean, it definitely helps. Right. But you listen, like guys like that, that are going out there and they're doing, you know, creative financing, they're buying things subject to where, you know, and, and a lot of wholesalers think it's no deal. And they're like, here, here's a lead. All right. And like, they're, he's, he's tying it up going, I'll pay 200 grand even though it's only worth 160 because I'm getting 350 bucks a month cash flow. Yeah. We just got a deal in Texas where if you don't ask, you're not going to get it. It's in an area where we probably wouldn't have done the deal. But we said, Hey, I'll give you 80,000. No, you know, no interest, no payments for, you know, six months. I'm going to rehab it and sell it. Uh, but I want to preserve my capital. And he said, okay, he got a first trust deed against the asset. He gave us terms on the deal. He didn't have to, all he had to do was shut the door and move out. So he didn't even live in it. I think he, was, he inherited the house. Him and his sister inherited the house. So would you say that over the next, you know, three to 12 months, 18 months, that that's probably the place to be in? Um, one of the best places to be in because there may not be a lot of foreclosures, but there's probably a lot of people that want to move that don't want to short sell <laughs> that this could create a ton of opportunity. Yeah, and I, I don't know where your users are. Um, or where they're buying, but it, it's regional. It's completely regional. I mean, our uh, Sacramento. I'm not going to get that kind of deal. Not right now. You know, because the iBuyer leads. They have they're uh, they're shopping two, three, four of us at a time. Sometimes they pick and choose you because they want to work with you. Whether your offer is better, or you're a better buyer, or other. You know, uh, if you go into some of these areas where you have significantly less competition and you are doing $20,000 houses out of state and you're getting terms. It's so much easier to get terms on that kind of stuff. But. Yeah, no, totally, totally. We're now talking about iBuyers real quick because you have kind of an iBuyer background in a sense. Um, different but similar. Who do you think, do you think they're going to succeed in the iBuyer world um, or, or do you think that a lot of them are going to fail? Which model out of the, the, you know, the Zillow and the Red Door and those kind of that you actually think has the most potential of being successful? So I got on a couple of them like as a preferred buyer. And I think that the, tr the, the longevity of that model requires them to make more of every lead. And they, sometimes you just can't do that with an analyst, you know, um, I, have, I kind of look at it this way. If you've never lost money in real estate, you really don't even know how to structure a deal. Like, cause until you can think about how you're going to write your contract. So that never happens again, or, 
you know, issues that come along with it. If it's not your money, they're going to structure and think about these deals completely different. So deal comes in and I refer it. And I'm like, look, you know, based off of how much money you want, and I know I'm not going to be able to give you that. Maybe what you need is a refi. You send that lead to Bo, or maybe what you need is a, a sale. It's a retail sale. You refer it for a commission to an agent, or maybe you look for a partnership you know, a joint venture on the deal. You put up the money and you get some kind of equitable split. If the iBuyers aren't thinking like us smaller guys, they're not going to operate like our smaller guys. And they have a very specific buy box. If it's, say, 1978 or newer, that way they're two years after the, the, the asbestos stuff you know, and they're ahead of the, the lead based claims. They're not into that product where you have to test it for lead. You have to test it for asbestos. You have to pull a permit. You have to, they have a buy box. And if it fits in that buy box, they buy it on a smaller margin. They're fee based. They have a cost of money, but they're fee based. You know, they get the fees for selling it. They get the fees for buying it. They get the fees for managing it. That's just a completely different model of what we do as operators. We buy, fix and sell, buy, fix and hold. Um, and we have, you, you move the comma over, we do 10 deals, they do a hundred, you know, we do a hundred, they do a thousand, you know, from across the, they, they may have a, you know, California analyst and that guy's in LA and he does not know Walnut Creek from Citrus Heights, you know, it's this far on a map, <laughs> that far equals four X the product point, you know, Walnut Creek is a gainfully employed community, you know, Citrus Heights is better than community Sacramento. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a lot of them like stopped buying for a minute and it seems like they came back in. Um, now yeah. they're starting to, they're starting to I buy. Again. To, to more cater it to your question. I think Zillow, if they can figure out how to still be Zillow and buy their model was criticized for being counterproductive. People go there to see the value of their asset. If they don't trust you in the value, cause you're going to be making them an offer below the market value of that or other, it just puts this unnecessary haze there when in reality they were the first ones to say, here's an algorithm of what I think your house is worth. And if you got a better idea of what it's worth then go use that better idea, but they had no competition, you know, like, then uh, their hit count is just ginormous. So the dollars spent on advertising and other between realtor.com and Zillow and any of the majors, if you're an eye buyer and you're competing against that stuff, it's not a level playing field. Yeah, we're like the guys, you guys and girls you used to work with, like, do are any of them kind of starting to come back into like? Do you see any kind of movement with those kind of like private funds that are looking now, thinking that are they are they trying to gear up? Do you think or everybody? yeah, all of them are. People are um, people are really you know they really believe they can do it different or better or other. I'm not, I'm actually seeing people doing them in the insurance industry, the same model in the insurance industry. And it, it's a really good group that we built, that we had there within the imitation homes world. Um, and our competitors too. So if you guys go to the IMN, you get a great opportunity to network and try and figure out what's happening with buyers, vendors, lenders, you know, you get a chance to really dive into that stuff. And IMN puts it together and organizes it for people. If you, for anybody looking for a place to research it. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Well, I don't want to take up too much of your time. We've been on almost 50 minutes. I could feel like I can ask you questions all day, but um, any, uh, any, any parting uh, words like, um, you know, yeah, I, you know, I, I feel like uh, if, if someone's on the fence and they're really, really, really close to something or, or wanting to pull the trigger, a lot of the deals nowadays make sense from a few different angles. You know, they're, they're below the cost of replacement. They, you can still flip it. You can keep it as a rental or other, depending on your market you're in. The fear is not there yet for us as investors. Like we're not two weeks ago, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, it has changed every single week, but our stuff's going pending. And people are still at the level of we're selling stuff. It's not to service industry. You know, there's not much product under 250. It's not like you're selling. A lot of people are still gainfully employed and they're looking for a place to live. And it's highly competitive. And California is so unfriendly with their rental market and, the, you know, with their squeezing people that even the buy and hold world, like, I think the rental world is going to shrink and which does nothing but put pressure up on rents. 
You mean shrink that there's gonna like just you will sell. They'd rather sell. You can sell a single family here and buy an almost new build fourplex out of state. You know, for whatever reason you're selling, um, it some people will be turned off by the changes in the rental world, like permanent tenancy. That sounds fair. Yeah. No, that that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I could see why. I mean, the, it's kind of scary, like reading these headlines of, you know, no payments for twelve months for tenants, right? And I think that sends a message to people that can can pay, and then they think they don't need to pay. Yeah, I mean, for my parting words there, it's like, do it, just get in there. Whether you're doing your first deal or whether you're doing your tenth deal, you know, there's just stuff. There's a pent up demand. There are people out there, you know, looking, and there are people willing to invest in your education if you if you don't have it yet to get your purchase agreements intact and referrals for uh, attorneys or agents and other there it's on the real estate investment side. It's still very, very active. Very good, Tommy. Well, thank you. And thanks everybody for listening. Love you guys. Thanks for listening to the investor financing podcast for show notes and useful resources. Please visit investor financing podcast.com for questions or comments, email info at investor financing podcast.com. If you enjoy our show, please share it with your network until next time.